God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. These are, of course, the opening words to Bill and Gloria Gaither's beloved hymn, Because He Lives. And I open this sermon with these lyrics in order to frame everything that will follow, which is to say this won't be the last time that I will reference this hymn. But for right now, I quote this first stanza in order to bring into focus the central issue that is at the core of today's reading from St. John's first epistle. For you see, this magisterial letter, this letter that has done so much for teaching us about love and about how God's essential nature is love, this remarkable letter that is seemingly about love was actually written in order to deny a very specific heresy that had recently grown popular within the Christian community. You see, at this time, many had come to believe that Jesus was never really human, that is, never really embodied, never really flesh and blood. Instead, these individuals believed Jesus only appeared to be human. Oh, he was in fact God, they claimed, but his human nature was a mere apparition. For how could God remain God and yet be trapped inside human form? Worse yet, how could God remain God and yet condescend to be crucified? killed by human hands. How? Well, according to these individuals, later called the Docetists, the answer was quite simple. God couldn't. God wouldn't. Thus, their way of explaining what happened in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus was simply to say, oh, he was God, but he was never really human in the first place. He was always eternal. There was no mortality in him to begin with. Now, I won't begin by getting us in the theological weeds this morning, but suffice it to say that if Jesus were not truly human, that is, if God did not in fact take on human form in all of its trappings and limitations, then the whole story of his death and resurrection is meaningless so far as the eternal future of humankind goes. Which is to say, unless it was a true human, just like us, that was raised from the dead on that third day, and thus a flesh and blood representative of other true humans, just like us, to likewise be raised on that final day, Unless so, there is no ground in which to place our human hope for tomorrow. That is no calm assurance to be found for us in the Christian story. Well, St. John, of course, knew that. And what's more, he knew that members of his community were being tempted by this new belief. And so that is why the very first line of this letter is John reminding his community of his own authority on the matter as one who walked with and talked with Jesus. That is why John opens this letter by writing, and I quote, We declare to you what we have seen with our own eyes and what we have touched with our own hands what we have touched with our own hands. 
I'm telling you, John is saying, he was real. He was human. He was just like us. Believe me. And on and on he then goes from there, trying then to spell out the implications of what it then means that God would take on human flesh. And what it then means that God would be crucified by human hands. And what it then means that God was once more raised as a human being on the third day. Yes, the rest of John's letter is his attempt to spell out the implications of what God's incarnation and subsequent resurrection as a glorified human being really means. We learn something here, John is saying. We learn everything here, John is saying, about our future hope and with it about the very fundamental nature of God. We learn through this, John is saying, we learn through all of this that God not only loves, but that God is love. And what's more, John is saying, when we come to really believe and really trust this love of God, this love that took on human flesh so as to ensure our salvation, This love which ensures our future hope. When we come to really believe and to really trust this love, John is saying, then we in turn seek to embody this same kind of love. This same kind of humble, hopeful, self-giving love ourselves. We see it, John is saying. We absorb it. We take it in, and then we reflect it back. We love, John writes, because he first loved us. Let me now share with you a beautiful theological image, and then let me follow that by telling you a very difficult story to tell. First, the image. In theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar's book, Love Alone is Credible, Balthasar, trying to explain the reciprocal nature that begins with God's love, but then gets absorbed by and taken in by and then mirrored back by our own love, That is, in trying to help us further understand what it means to say that we love because God first loved us. Trying to explain what it means to say that we are changed by seeing love directed at us. In trying to explain this phenomenon, Baltazar writes, After one has smiled at a child for many days and weeks, He finally receives the child's smile in response. He has now awakened love in the heart of the child. Isn't that beautiful? In other words, the child learns how to smile. The child absorbs the joy and the love and the tenderness into herself by first seeing it directed at her by another. We see it, we receive it, we absorb it, we take it in, and then we reflect it back. The child smiles back at the one who first smiled at her. So that's the image. So now then let me tell you the difficult story. On September 15th, 2013, at about noon, April and I had just finished church and had just sat down to lunch with some friends when April got a phone call from her mother. April answered the call at the table and upon hearing the first few words from her mother, I watched her face go flush and immediately she stood up and walked outside. 
She then stayed on the phone for nearly 20 minutes, and from where I was sitting, I could see her out the window, emotionally pacing up and down, back and forth on the sidewalk. I obviously knew something was terribly wrong. Well, finally, she got off the phone, and I saw her off the phone. And so I walked outside to where she had sat down on the sidewalk. And there, red-faced and with tears in her eyes, she told me that her 32-year-old brother, Casey, had just been diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer had been given anywhere from six weeks to six months to live and was being immediately flown from Asheville to Winston-Salem, North Carolina to have an emergency surgery done at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. The news couldn't have been more jarring. It was completely unexpected. He'd only been complaining of stomach pains for a couple of weeks. Stage four. Up until now, he had not only been healthy, but he had been strapping a larger-than-life figure, seemingly invincible. And none of us could believe it. But alas, it was true. And so it was that he was flown to Winston-Salem, right down the road from where we ourselves lived at the time and he was slated for surgery in a matter of days. Well, as I said, the news was jarring for us. Perhaps a better word for it would be traumatic. And at this same time, April was 33 weeks pregnant. And so that following day, as she and I sat together at the hospital with her family, she suddenly whispered to me, not wanting to alarm her already overwhelmed parents, that she was suddenly experiencing tremendous abdominal pain. So without referencing where we were going or what we were doing, we quietly slipped out of that hospital waiting room and we headed to a different hospital just miles away, the one where our doctor practiced. Now, I won't drag out this part of the story, but suffice it to say that due to the stress and the trauma of the moment, April went into early labor that evening, and by 8 a.m. the following morning, our first child had been born. A four-pound, six-ounce baby girl named Ada. This precious child was then taken directly to the NICU where we, her stunned parents, spent every waking hour right there beside her little bed. While meanwhile, right across town, our brother prepared for surgery. All of this, please understand, was happening at the exact same time, approximately five miles apart. And one hospital, the specter of death for our family, and with it the palpable presence of sadness and hopelessness and despair. And another hospital, the miracle of life. And with it the palpable presence of love and hope and wonder, all at the same time. Now I'll pick back up that story momentarily. For now, though, stanza number two. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy they give. But how greater still the calm assurance that she can face on certain days because he lives. Surgery went as well as could be hoped for. Within two weeks, Casey was discharged from the hospital and allowed to go home. 
Then two weeks after that, Ada was also discharged from the hospital and we too were allowed to go home. And so we did. And we tried as best we could as a family to experience the joy that comes with having a new baby while not being overcome with grief and sorrow over the certainty that our brother's time was short. Well, within a few weeks after that, Casey was brought back to Winston-Salem for a follow-up visit with his surgeon. And April drove with baby Ada to the hospital that day so that her brother could meet his newborn niece for the first time. Casey was weak from his surgery at this point. Not nearly the same towering, overpowering presence that he'd always been. And they met there in the hospital parking lot. It was cold that day, and so Casey got into April's car. And there in the warmth of that Volvo, April placed Ada into his lap. Cradling her little five-pound body in his enormous hand, Casey looked down on her in wonder and joy and love, and he smiled. And we have a picture of that moment, and something that we as a family will forever cherish. Casey would then later say to his home church, while giving his testimony not long before he passed, All through this ordeal, my family was in despair. But God stepped in and delivered a baby. A baby of joy. And she was staring into the eyes of people in pure misery. And she was a beautiful hope for us. There holding this baby in his hands. Smiling at her, he loved her immediately, loved her for who she was and for what she represented and for what she was doing to hold his family together. Yes, there holding her, he looked down upon her. And there in his love, our little baby girl and with her all the rest of us, there she and we learned how to love back. When I told April about our new sermon series, Scriptures That Sustain Us, and how I was eager for stories that explain why certain verses are favorites for people, she readily volunteered to me her own favorite scripture. 1 John 4.19, she said to me, We love because he first loved us. If you'll recall, she went on, that next year when Ada was close to two, our church had the children make Valentine cards to give to a loved one. And Ada made a little heart-shaped card for Casey. And on the back of that card was that verse, we love because he first loved us. Well, I didn't know it until later April went on. But Casey not only kept that card, but he kept it on his dresser mirror. And after he passed away a few months later, my mom found it. She saved it for me. And so that verse will always be my favorite verse, my wife said to me. That verse is the verse she said that sustains me. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she gives. But how greater still the calm assurance that she can face uncertain days because he lives. She can face uncertain days And oh, how uncertain our days in this fleeting life are. 
For how else do you explain a 32-year-old man, a lifelong athlete, a man in peak physical condition, virtually overnight being diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer? How else do you explain a young husband, the three-year-old son, a one-year-old daughter, selling being told he has a matter of months to live? How do you explain these things? How do you justify these things? How do you reconcile these things? How do you come to any sort of peace with these things? Well, according to St. John in his first epistle, without the bodily Jesus Christ, crucified and raised from the dead, without that, according to St. John, we can't. For without that, John writes, there is no calm assurance, meaning there is no future purpose in which to ground our hope. But with that, John writes, we have hope for the future and so much besides. For with that, John writes, all of life is revealed to have a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose. And while we can't see it and while we can't fully comprehend it, we know that it points forward to the moment when we, like Jesus, will be raised to newness of life ourselves. That, St. John reminds his community, is the only way. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Casey Ryan Nicholson passed away on March 23rd, 2016, two years later than doctors had initially thought he would. His funeral was held two days after his passing, on a Saturday, the day just before Easter. And so that following morning, now back in Corbin, Kentucky, myself, having left April and the girls in Hendersonville with her grieving family, now I stood before my church and tried my best to preach on the promise of resurrection. However, while I no doubt believed the words I was saying, my own emotional vulnerability, and with it my anger at the injustice of it all, prevented me from absorbing just how necessary the Easter story was for myself and for my own family in that moment. For we needed that hope on that Easter more than ever. It wasn't until I finished my own sermon that day and we began singing the following words that I was once more seized by and comforted by and overwhelmed by the power of the Easter story myself. That I was once more reminded of what the resurrection of the bodily Jesus meant for Casey and for me and for my family and for the entire world. Suddenly as I joined my church in singing these following words, the power of it all came back to me. The promise, the purpose, the meaning of it all, of everything. And then one day, I'll cross the river and I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. Dear family, the magisterial letter we know as 1 John tells us so much more than simply what love is and where love comes from. It tells us that because Christ lives, we can face tomorrow. 
And that because he lives, all fear is gone. It tells us that because we know he holds the future, that our lives are worth the living, no matter the uncertainty of the days they are lived in. Oh, dear family, let us never forget in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, love took on human flesh. In the person of Jesus of Nazareth, love looked down upon us and smiled. And because love did, we love and we hope and we trust. Yes, we love because he first loved us. A scripture that sustains my wife. A scripture that sustains the world. Amen.